Uh, welcome to the best of the CFA Summit, uh, hosted by Microsoft New York and Beta NYC. Thank you for our dear, dear sponsors of Code for America and Microsoft. Uh, this event wouldn't be possible really uh, without the uh, the invitation of Code for America to get us out there, and then Microsoft to host us. Uh, so can we just give the Code for America people and the Microsoft people a big round of applause? Yeah. Um, so just to kind of set the stage um, and manage your expectations of what you're experiencing this evening, we're doing our welcome, so welcome. Uh, then we're going to do some introductions. Uh, then we're going to do a little thing that we call meet the neighbors. Uh, we'll get into some presentations and then we'll have an open discussion. Uh, how many of you have not been to a Beta NYC event before? Great. Well, welcome. Uh, Beta NYC, thanks for being a part of the meetup group. Uh, Beta NYC is dedicated to civic technology, smart communities, and participatory government. What does that mean like in English speak? Well, we're a community uh, platform for digital civic engagement. Uh, we meet routinely on Wednesday nights. Uh, we primarily meet at a tech vocational program that you might have read about in the New York Times called Dev Boot Camp, which is at 48 Wall Street here in New York City. Uh, and we meet every Wednesday to more or less unpack and demystify technology, data, design, um, and more or less civics. Um, uh, so how do we do that? We do that through uh, education, events, tools, advocacy, and you are all in a safe space. Um, so uh, the two people who helped check you in, Lucio and Haley, are here in the front row. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, if, if you have any issues, you can either come see them, uh, you can come see me, you can see Ariel, who's one of the speakers back over here, um, and we, or Matt, um, we will, we're essentially here to provide a safe, welcoming environment for everyone, um, and uh, if you have any problems at all, come find us. Um, next Wednesday, we're going to continue our, our hack nights, because that's what we do on Wednesdays. Um, and we're going to kind of, we're, one of the projects of the hack night is related to legislation that we got passed. And that legislation is the open city record uh, law that passed a few months ago, uh, which means that the city has to provide a machine readable schema uh, for the city record. And next Wednesday, we're going to start building that schema. We're going to start tearing apart what the city record is. The city record, for those of you who don't know, is the city's newspaper that has all public hearings, uh, all procurement notices, procurement awards, job postings, court proceedings, rule announcements, legal changes, and sometimes there's an advertisement that's thrown in uh, ever so often. It's really like the if you know what a change log is, it, it is the city's change log. It documents everything that goes to the city. And since the 1800s, the city has mandated that uh, the city's actions are published in a in a daily newspaper, and that's the city record. And fortunately, uh, more or less since the last year, it's been kept in a database that we're a able a, 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 a pretty elegant database uh, that we're going to be able to pull from and to build a shared schema with the city of New York. And then come. June of next year, June or July of next year, the city hopefully will be publishing all of this data in the schema. Uh, for those of you who don't know a schema, it's kind of like an outline. It's a defined outline. Uh, and so by this time next year, we hope to be sitting on um, all public hearing announcements in a easy to use format, as well as procurement notices, which is something that we're all fighting for. So that way we can either A, make money or figure out what the hell is going on within government, uh, or at least what they're trying to do within government. Um, and so next Wednesday, join us. We'll be combining our advocacy and kind of like our hacktivism together. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be doing these beta talks on a monthly cadence. Uh, we don't have any beta talks scheduled right now, but hopefully we'll be working with the city to get the city CTO to come and talk to us, which is something that they have offered. Um, some of the th wins that we have, I know that this is small print, but essentially we're a mixture of a good government group 
um, and a, like a civic hacktivism group. Uh, we embody that within the terms of civic technology. So we fight to get legislation passed. We've been advocating for a, a more transparent and participatory government, which we're getting through this administration, which is something that we were getting from the last administration, but we just want to keep the cadence up. Uh, some of you are big apps winners, and you came from this particular community. We essentially, uh, we're, we're here to help uh, unlock the city data. Um, and, you know, like, um, that's an easy explanation of this. Ways that you can connect with us. Um, we have a collection of working groups that are offered at this bit.ly link. You can join us on Facebook. And then if you're a developer, we have a dedicated list for you. Uh, it's, it's your little safe space on the internet to come and hang out. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Matt Stempek, who's part of Microsoft Civic and our gracious host this evening. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you for coming out. I'm gonna make this quick because Peter has to go to a business dinner. <laughs> um, but basically, this is our house and welcome to our house. We squat with Microsoft Research and we are this new small team of civic tech people at Microsoft. And what that means is that we're here in New York City to support groups like Beta NYC and basically help civic innovation happen and accelerate it and bring it to scale and all those good things. Um, and I'm especially excited that this event is happening because I wanted to continue momentum locally of every, all the conversations that ha were happening at the summit and also bring back kind of the highlights for everyone that did, didn't get to go because I always feel like I miss out on big conferences like that. So hopefully you have fun tonight and I'll talk more later, but let's get Peter up here. Thanks, Matt. You're the best. <laughs> Sorry to rush such an important thing. Um, I am really excited to address you shortly before I go um, to a meeting to keep the lights on and whatnot so that we have the luxury to do impact work. So I've been working with uh, Code for America for about a year and a half. And so we mentor, NEO is an innovation lab uh, consulting firm, kind of like IDEO, but we build shit. And we love IDEO, but we build shit. Um, <laughs> and we like applying our processes to bigger problems, right? It's cool to build lucrative bridges to millennials, but like solving the world's big problems really uh, make you feel nice. So we've been working with Code for America, the accelerator teams, the brigades, the, uh, the fellows teams, and actually have been uh, advising the staff as well on how they can better uh, kind of support their vision. Why we're really excited about Code for America is not the discrete projects that they do, although that is what you can point to and say, wow, Blight Tracker is amazing. Wow, that Honolulu City uh, like reboot of their website is awesome. What we believe, what I believe Code for America can do is basically reboot the public perception of public service. Similar to how Teach for America made it so that the best and the brightest can go into teaching as a profession and hold their heads high and have their parents think that they're doing good work, I believe that Code for America in the long term can actually create a movement so that the best and the brightest and people with new thoughts and new ideas and new skills can actually think that going into public service is a worthwhile pursuit or starting a B Corp or a company that, that works on bigger, hairier issues. Some of the things that came out of the Code for America Summit for me that I wanted to share, one of them is this notion of with, not for. Right? These are working with communities and respecting that these communities have a hell of a lot to offer. And this is not missionary technology coming in to save the day. Right? These are leveraging people power. And, and you know, technology is not the answer. People who make effective decisions are the answer. And so one of the themes that I loved was this notion of with, not for. You're not here to save the day. You are not a superhero. You are partaking in a dialogue that has been going on for a long time. Um, another thing that I really enjoyed was people's focus, and it builds off of this, on, um, you know, technology is not the answer. For these big problems, for poverty, for issues of injustice, there is not an app for that, right? Technology, it's augmented intelligence and not artificial intelligence. You are going to give people tools to make better decisions to improve people's lives. You are not going to have a replacement technology, right? Um, and so that, for me, was a big kind of takeaway. It's, it's with, not for. It's not as simple as a technological solution. And finally, they say it's, it's super pithy, right? You go to these conferences and you learn awesome things from the stage. You're going to hear a lot of really cool projects and work going on um, and companies being built. Um, but it really is a movement. And the conference was incredible. We were being inspired from the stage. We were actually having super meaningful action-oriented conversations in the hallway. Uh, we had Ignite Talks where people were sharing very personal stories after spending a whole day learning and cramming our brains with all this beautiful 
innovative things from the stage, we took time to, to get fun and get quirky and have people share, right? And then after that, of course, we went and did karaoke until about two in the morning. Um, and so Matt, as a backup dancer to uh, <laughs> ACDC, might have been my shining moment. Um, but it was just this amazing thing where, where it honestly, and it sounds pithy, like the interactions and the actions that came out of the connections there, um, which is being brought back here tonight, um, was as important as the badass kind of companies and, and, and projects and products you're going to hear. Um, and so thank you uh, for hosting and thank you for letting me butt ahead of you. And I'm so sorry to trivialize such an awesome evening. I just have to make sure the lights stay on. Um, but yeah, my email is the letter P at neo.com. I run a community called Civic Love in San Francisco. We do TEDx Market Street. Um, I have an office in the Flatiron two blocks from here, so I get back. Uh, it's at Peter Shanley is my Twitter, P at neo. I would love to connect with folk. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Sorry to run. Beautiful. So Peter's in town from San Francisco, so we had to make sure we caught him literally in motion. Um, let me go back to me real quick. Uh, so I'm just going to share some like quick riffs and general themes that I saw there um, so you can feel like you were there. And also because they're important conversations that we should keep working on. Um, one was that you guys, if you read a lot on Tech President with Mika Sifri's writing or other similar people have written a lot this year about what we even mean by the phrase civic tech. And there's a lot of really intelligent um, writing on this, but it's always sort of bothered me as a super broad phrase where I heard urban planners using it, and I heard like ICT for D, like development people using it, and I'd love to get a little more specific as we define these different fields, just because something's like technology for good, it's not always civic tech. And so one thing that was really refreshing for me at Code for America Summit was that there was a growing um, appetite for using GovTech when you're describing technology that governments are going to use for, for citizens, and civic tech as this layer of, including GovTech, but this layer of what citizens do, and you know, activism tech could go into civic tech. And then GovTech, um, I think we maybe avoided it for a while because government IT technology, uh, T is technology, um, has such a bad reputation, so much baggage and legacy. Um, but GovTech is sort of the, the new branding that we can use where we're still saying what we mean to say. Um, so that was nice. And in that, in that realm, it was nice to see projects like Git Machines. Have you guys, are you familiar with it at all? So no, no one. Right? So Git Machines is, um, yes, David, nice. Um, Greg Elgin's project, basically, as a developer, it gives you a server that you can just start using that already complies with a bunch of boring government regulations. Um, so as a developer trying to build fun things and innovative things, you don't need to spend like six months figuring out how to be compliant with federal procurement standards. Um, and I might try to drive this here, just so you can look at stuff while I talk. And so that's just one example, but I like this idea that um, sort of the way we don't write a framework from scratch every time we want to build something, we won't have to do all the government social side of our work every time we want to build something for government. So that was pretty cool. Um, another fun thing was Mike Flowers, New York's own, um, he gave a great talk and keynote in general, but one of my favorite parts of it was he mentioned that while working for the city, he created an org chart of what people actually do and like actual power of the org chart, which you might imagine looks different than the official org chart. Um, so I'm thinking of doing that at Microsoft, so I can figure out how to do my job. <laughs> Katie's gonna help me with that. Um, another conversation I had with uh, Marcy Harris and Popbox and other people was that there's a real long tail of municipalities and counties in the US that we're not really reaching, that you know, New York City, London, Boston have awesome or new urban mechanic type um, departments in city government but there's like thousands and tens of thousands of smaller municipalities that basically buy technology when someone comes to tell them about it. And so we started thinking about ways to try to get these hip Code for America startups that are doing amazing new technology in front of more of these thousands and thousands of longer tail, smaller municipalities that don't necessarily have like an innovation person. Um, and so I was thinking of ways that Microsoft and other companies who do have a public sector sales force or have conferences that they go to of county officials could start trying to help bridge that uh, gap there in, in terms of just scaling the space. Um, Jen Palka had an amazing quote about how thanking the people at CFA Summit who are a lot of software developers and high tech people who could have 
made the internet their culture and really made the internet their community. And growing up when the internet was still somewhat smaller, um, it felt like that. Like, and it was actually a lot more comfortable and more, more comfort zone for techies to have the people online be your community. And the real world institutions were a lot scarier and analog and older and didn't like you. And um, so it's kind of nice that people in civic tech are sort of that bridge between the, the new tech and the real life geographically bound communities that still really matter for our lives. And that's it kind of reframed civic tech for me in terms of the conscious choice that we've made to care about the physical environment that we're in, in addition to the fun stuff online that is obviously way more fun. Um, and that went with this other great pithy quote, which was, we're not here to change government websites, we're here to change government. Which I know um, a lot of us, when you do civic tech, you could very easily spend all of your time and make a good living building websites so that they're nicer looking. Um, but changing like the fundamental processes and organizations underneath those websites can be a little more disastrous. And, um, and uh, Peter mentioned design with, not for, which I'm sure we'll hear more about tonight. But that was Lauren Allen McCann's great talk, which really brought to a head this conversation. Um, other people call it co-design. It's the same idea of you know designing with communities and not coming in from on high with your tools. Um, and I'll post the link in the meetup group, but you should really watch the video from her talk. It's great and definitely the brightest yellow slides you've ever seen. Um, let's see what else. And lastly, I went to a really great session on how to actually do um, kind of product testing with live citizens who you don't know already. Were you there too? Yeah. Yeah, it was great, right? I did. Yeah, they made us fold origami, and I got like two steps in. Um, and the point of the exercise was that when instructions are terrible, how to, wit how to watch someone fail at instructions, fail at a website without stepping in to help them, just watch them and empathize and kind of learn how they're doing it. Um, and so we got a good training on how to kind of practice testing our technology with real citizens out in public and kind of tips and tricks for saying, hey, can I have five minutes of your time? I'm just here to study X, Y, or Z. Um, can I watch you, you know, go to Starbucks? I'm sure Katie and others at Microsoft Research have way better methodologies than this, but um, there's a group uh, was it in Chicago, it's a citizen user group. So in Chicago, they, they pay people from all walks of life to actually be tested users so that you have representative samples. Because we talk a lot about lean startup and iterating, but when you're only testing with your friends or not even that, um, it's a little harder. So those are my top highlights, and um, thanks again for coming, and really look forward to what everyone else has to say. And I'll go ahead and introduce um, <laughs> Masuda, come on down. <laughs> New York Zone. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. Um, I'm just going to talk about a project that we are doing. I work for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We're in Long Island City, Queens. Talk louder. We're in Long. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I can I can uh, also try to scream. Um, so I work at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We're in Long Island City, Queens, and we worked on a project where we were using Yelp data to identify foodborne disease outbreaks. Um, and one of the things that I noticed when I was at the conference is that I am more of an end user consumer and I'm not a developer. Um, the people that we work with at Columbia are researchers, um, so they're not as interested in the development aspects, they're more interested in the research and so are we. So this is just kind of describing um, what we were interested in doing with kind of um, publicly available data. So just a little background on foodborne diseases. It is, it continues to be a challenge in the United States. A lot of people get sick. And a lot of our outbreaks, um, a lot of the confirmed outbreaks that get reported are associated with restaurants. And you can imagine how in New York City that's a big issue because we have a ton of restaurants. Um, there are about 24,000 restaurants and about 15,000 grocery stores. Um, and two out of three New Yorkers eat out, report eating out at least once a week. Um, and traditionally, we have heard before we started looking at, you know, internet data, um, you can report a foodborne illness to us by calling 311. Um, and we get about 3,000 complaints per year. And, the, you know, the thing about these complaints is that they're all people who are calling because they're sick. Um, and among those complaints, we identify about 30 
actual outbreaks each year. So a few years ago, while we were investigating an outbreak that we'd heard about through 311, we had people that we were talking to and they said, you know, we noticed that people are complaining on Yelp about the same restaurant. Um, and this was something that, you know, we always were interested in doing and obviously online review sites are incredibly common. Uh, so we decided to collaborate. We had a friend actually at, the, at Columbia University in the Department of Computer Science who's very interested in, in machine learning. And so he was really interested in this project and so he has you know, students that rotate with him, master's students and PhD students in computer science. So he lends us these students to work with us and um, develop this way to look at Yelp data to use restaurant reviews um, to identify unreported foodborne complaints. So basically what we're doing, and we had to collaborate with Yelp to get the data. Um, I don't know, you know, you guys might know more about, you know, how open Yelp's data is, but back when we started this project, uh, in order for us to get the data that we needed for New York City restaurants, we needed for them to provide the data to us. Um, and we look at the reviews and Columbia has built this program to extract keywords, detect temporal statements and multiple illness reports among the reviews. And we score the reviews based on um, several different criteria. We look for keywords that indicate an illness. We look for multiple people who might get sick. We look for a relevant incubation period because of course, you know, people always think that they got sick from the meal that they had an hour ago. And that's not always true with many of our pathogens. And then it, it um, spits back a score. Oh, you have a question. Yeah, how, how do you determine So we don't always have like the time period, but sometimes people put in their review that they ate there yesterday. They don't always, but when they do. Um, if they don't have a time period, then we would still include it. Um, and then, you know, they get scored and then we look at um, certain ones for human review. But you know, the program pulls all these reviews and we have to then manually go through and read each review and determine if it's an episode of illness related to a restaurant. Did the illness occur recently? Sometimes people are complaining about a restaurant where they ate a year ago and all of a sudden it popped into their mind that they wanted to review it. Um, are there more than um, a couple of people who are sick or was it a severe illness? And then we contact the reviewers to schedule a phone interview. Um, and then we do our, our uh, foodborne disease investigation. And this is our routine investigation, no matter how we found out about an outbreak, we really need to talk to patients. Um, and you know, people are surprisingly interested in talking to us about their illness. Um, <laughs> we inspect restaurants and then we collect and test food samples and hopefully you know, we'll find a pathogen, we'll figure out what the food item was, we'll find problems at the restaurant that we can correct and prevent um, future outbreaks. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of this, the pro so the program pulls, pulled both of these as potential um, illness complaints and one of them, you know, is clearly not an illness complaint. And so, you know, there's a lot of work being done out there to look at, you know, Google flu trends and try to kind of track disease data based on, you know, reviews that are out there. But the, the really, I think, unique thing about the project that we're doing is that we are really looking at the data to kind of say these are real and these are not real. Um, and then this kind of feeds back to Columbia, who is again interested in the machine learning to try to refine the algorithm and really pull the data that we are interested in. Um, we get a lot of these. The backyard is so, area is so sick, the music, there's this one reviewer that keeps, you know, he's a DJ and he keeps posting about how sick the music is at like all the restaurants where he DJs. We get a ton of them. They have to get pulled. You know, we have no choice. So, you know, there is a, there is a, a lot of work that goes into that. Um, and so this is just to give you an idea out of 4,000 reviews that we, that the program pulled in about a two year time period. Um, about half of them indicated a real food poisoning event. So there is a lot of noise in the data, um, but we did find six outbreaks that we wouldn't have identified otherwise. Um, so one, some of the conclusions, we realized that online review sites are an important, um, or social media data and you know open data out there are an important source of data for finding foodborne outbreaks. Of the complaints that we thought were real, less than 10% of them were actually reported to the health department, so that's a concern. 
Um, Yelp reviews do provide information on restaurants that may pose a public health risk. And again, as I said before, this is unique because it does provide data to us, but it allows us to validate the reviews that are pulled by a text classifier. Our next steps are, try to, are to add additional sources of social media data, like Twitter, to again refine the machine learning and analysis and continue our partnerships with academic, private, and other government agencies. And these are my colleagues that I've worked with, and thank you very much for your time. Super excited to see New York represented at CFA Summit in such a cool way. Um, all right, so David Moore. David Moore. Uh, some of the uh, so I just want to point out that the Vashuda. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, uh, that she was a main stage speaker, so you got to see some main stage action right up here. Um, and so now I'm gonna hand this over to to David Moore, who's uh, David Moore. How's it going, everyone? Thanks. Um, I'm glad to be here. So the CFA Summit was really nice. Uh, it's great to see so many um, practitioners in the field all together coming from across the country in a place. You saw a bunch of people who actually really cared about how people use the tools, not just building it for the sake of building it. But there was a CFA has a really, really good emphasis on making sure that their tools are like reality-based, community-connected, and are reflective of like underserved communities and the needs of like really how city services can be more fairly and uh, with social justice like distributed. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly update uh, folks on a project that we're excited about. Um, our nonprofit is called the Participatory Politics Foundation. We've been active since 06 in open source tools for civic engagement, mostly websites. Um, and I did an unconference session at uh, the summit about a project called Councilmatic that we want to bring to New York City very badly. It's got tremendous potential to unlock the business of city council. What in the world is the New York City Council up to? It's really hard to figure out. And the website, unfortunately, is not as user friendly as it should be. We had the same problem in 2006 when we built opencongress.org to track bills and votes in the federal US Congress. We put a user-friendly interface on it, we put search on it, we wrote summaries of bills. We want to bring the same model of making the legislative process, like taking it from its weird arcaneness to bring, making it more accessible and opening it up to all sorts of community input and open data. We want to bring that same approach to the New York City Council. So we've got the software. It's called Councilmatic. Councilmatic is an open source code. It's up on GitHub. You can check it out. And it's, in, it's up and running in two places, Philadelphia and Chicago. So I'm, gonna sh I'm showing the Chicago site right now. What we want to do, and we're, ch we're, we're fundraising for charitable support to do this, is to rewrite Councilmatic to make it easier to use in more cities, but especially to launch it here in New York City. And I'll mention briefly what our plans are in New York in a second. So this is the this is the, this is the Councilmatic web app where you can search by keyword and then see what um, the details of bills. You can also go into individual committees. <clears throat> so this is live and you can check that you can check this out now. It's been around. You can go into a council members page, much like you can for other elected officials, and see what their uh, most recent bills are. You can subscribe to updates. One, one feature that's really, really cool about Councilmatic is that you can create a free login. <clears throat> gonna, cancel, gonna cancel that. Not now. I don't want anyone taking my public comments on municipal ordinances and taking them, and taking them too far. And then you can, with a free account, you can leave a comment on any individual piece of legislation and say, yo, this rules, and go ahead and post your statement. So I'm, I'm glad Chicago will have that piece of input from New York City. You know? What's good, Chicago? Councilmatic covers uh, city council members, municipal legislation, committees, and the actions of legislation. And there is no equivalent for New York City Council right now. The New York City government does not have this, and we can deliver it to them as a free and open source public resource. We're just looking for charitable funding support to build this project. It also wasn't possible until the data was available because the New York City Council, though it's made great, great strides in open data, and a lot of that is actually thanks to current Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer uh, and her time in the council, then also lots of other folks in the council have been supportive of this. Um, we've opened up data about what's going on in city council, so, but we haven't yet fully opened up the municipal process. 
like what local bills are in committees is not yet understandable to the public. So garbage, zoning, public health, um, school like uh, school budgets a lot of this stuff is really really important to your everyday life in like you know wherever you live in New York City but you can't have a user-friendly view of it or access to the open data behind it we're trying to give that to you for the first time and we're gonna do it by scraping the official city website and we're doing that in partnership with the open civic data project that I mentioned uh, from sunlight labs that's a community project it's open source so you encourage everyone to get involved this is a, a great opportunity to, to make um, lots and lots of cities, their work more accessible. So um, I'll round out my part <clears throat> by saying this is the website that we want to build. We want to build NewYorkCityCouncilmatic.org. We want it to be an open source, nonprofit public resource for anyone to track, share, and comment on the business of New York City Council government. We'll have profile pages for every elected official, make it easy to understand what's going on with council bills let them write summaries of them, translate them into other languages to make them more accessible, and let you get email alerts, which is a huge, huge feature. You, right now, we can give you email alerts about the issues that you care about in New York City Council. Um, the best thing to do to support this um, project is to go to participatorypolitics.org slash councilmatic, which is our public proposal uh, that we're sending to charitable foundations. I'd love any introductions you can give. Um, I'm easy to reach, and Noel knows how to reach me, and I'm uh, online all the time. And just put your name in here to say, I want Councilmatic for our city. It's a free and open source public resource. We're looking to build and launch this for New York City as soon as possible. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about our development roadmap, and I'll be around afterwards to share uh, our vision for this project. I hope, uh, hope to be able to make it a reality and hope to have you all involved. Thank you, Noel. Oh, and 10 Code for America brigades, at least, have signed on already that they want to use this. It can spread to dozens and dozens of cities nationwide right away. So, yeah. so thanks, David. Um, so next up is Matt from Local Data, also a former Code for America fellow, and he's going to talk about his little experience. I was told there was five minutes, so I'm going to use this bonus six minutes to my advantage here. Wait, wait, wait. Hey everybody, I'm Matt Hample, I've got six minutes. Um, <laughs> we're for a company that's called Local Data. Uh, we do data collection management tools for organizations. So I was there sort of in the spirit of being the Detroit co-captain, brigade co-captain for a while, being a recent transplant to New York City, looking at how, uh, and being a 2012 Code for America fellow with the mayor's office in the city of Detroit, looking at how the organization is changing and how the nationwide uh, movement, if it's, I think we're at that point, the nationwide movement is also evolving. So. I'm going to go through just a couple of projects that really stood out to me, and it's totally going to take like 30 seconds to go through there, and maybe go through a couple of the bigger themes that we've seen coming out this year. And I think the first project I wanted to touch on is called Transit Mix, and how, how many people have seen Transit Mix or used Transit Mix? Awesome, a fair amount of people. I think it's one of the projects from this year that went the furthest. It's really cool. You can go in, punch in your city, and redesign the transit networks that are there, whether it's one bus line or the entire network you can build it up from scratch and use it. And it started out in that sort of, hey, we're doing these public participatory meetings, how do we help people better design their transit system? And it was used by thousands and thousands of people around the world to do that. And I think what's really interesting is the team that built this is taking it from the system where it's sort of fun, you can go to their website, you can play around, you can design a transit system, but they're making it real for transit designers. So they're really working with the experts in the field to understand what does it cost to run a bus line? How does that vary by city? How can they help people get that really good, accurate information in there? So it's more than just a toy. It's more than just something that you can drag and drop and play around. And I think that's something really cool coming out of this major public project. Another project, very different angle, is the Detroit Water Project, and this was totally a side project. Um, Detroit Water Department started shutting off service to a lot of homeowners who couldn't pay, or residents who couldn't pay their bills in Detroit, offering very little assistance and very little clarity on what they can do to get the water back on, and it was sort of injudicious, it was unclear why this was happening, and so one of the fellows on their own time put together this site with a collaborator that I believe she hadn't met in person before, uh, to help get donations, and it's super simple. I think it's one of those things where going back to the roots of what's a super simple intervention that you can make from a distance. And being someone who's in Detroit, I kind of see these interventions like, first reaction is who are these outsiders? Who are these random people who are showing up doing something? And I think that's sort of a quick first reaction is, hey, I'm not from there, or these people aren't from here, how can they help? And I think it's huge tension that always needs to be resolved. 
but here they're taking some interesting steps. And so these both the team members here, not from Detroit, but they're getting people involved. Um, the biggest problem they found was not getting donations, but getting those donations to people on the ground. And what they have to do now is really build those relationships with existing nonprofits and existing organizations so that people can actually use this mo uh, money. They have 8,000 donors, and they're having a hard time finding people who actually want to use the money at last check. Okay, moving on to Chicago and Expungio. A really interesting service that is very little technology behind it. It's sort of a workflow. And really, the time that went into this um, project is figuring out how people can get their juvenile records expunged. So you have a record, you can, it is hurting you, you cannot get a job, you have a hard time continuing on in life with this there, but there are options for you. They're just really difficult to uh, understand. And the solution is really talking to the experts in the field, understanding how the process works, and bringing it together into simple buttons that also don't give people, that don't lock people into a corner. So you see there's that I'm not sure button here for every single question on the site. Uh, fourth one, third one, uh, from Atlanta, making it super easy to access your court information. And I think this is one of the big untapped uh, land masses in the civic tech world is the court system and the data that's locked in there. There's tons of open data going up in open data portals, but it's really the processes that are untapped. So this information on people who are in the middle of a system, it's hard to figure out where you're going and where you're, what's next and what came before and who's involved. This is one step towards that process, finding your court case, understanding what it is you can do before and avoiding that interaction with the court system and the huge long lines that are there. And two public health projects, and I think it's really interesting to see these in the light of Code for America treating bigger issues So as, as a package and as a sustained involvement. So one is balance for checking food stamps. So you have food stamps, how do you know how much money is on them? Uh, let's just do it as a text. And the second is called connect. So you're waiting on hold with someone. Can we build a tool that makes it so you don't have to wait on hold for an hour in the middle of a busy day, that a computer waits on hold for you and then just calls you back when you're done? And honestly, I wanted this for IKEA earlier today, so I can see a ton of different applications for this. And with both of these, I think the testing process was really interesting um, in that uh, with balance, they put out signs on the street. They also bought Google AdWords. What performed? The signs on the street performed great. Google AdWords did not perform. So thinking about how we're doing our outreach, how we're getting the word out to people, and how we're finding users who can interact with these. And with this connect process, it was a process of just testing it out, seeing, finding someone who had to wait online, uh, on the phone forever, using the system, and seeing if it would connect them with a real worker and how they would respond to it. And you can see the first person hung up on them. Um, so just to stitch it all together in the 30 seconds remaining, uh, I think there's a new focus to this movement. So we're seeing new focus from Code for America on health, on public safety, and on economic development. And I'm really excited about some of the stuff that's happening in the criminal justice system as well. So thank you very much. I'm Matt H. on Twitter, and my time is up. So next up is uh, Jacqueline Liu. Uh, not only uh, does she work for the Parks Department, but her opinions are her own, but she's also a neighbor. So uh, a neighbor from Greenpoint. So so hi, so thanks. This is actually, um, I'm super new to the Beta NYC community. This is actually my first time at the meetup. And um, so first I wanna thank Noel and Ariel and Matt and Chris and everyone else for being so welcoming. Um, but so you, that might need lead you, so that revelation might lead you to the next question, which is how did a noob like myself find myself at the Code for America Summit <laughs> this year? Um, and that's actually because currently um, at Parks, I'm working on planning a project. We're starting in May of 2015. We are gonna be engaging thousands of New Yorkers in a neighborhood-based mapping project to create the citywide map of New York City's street trees. Um, so this crowdsourcing of New York City street tree data has actually happened twice before. We did it in 1995, and then we did it again in 2005, which is why we're planning to do it again in 2015 um, <laughs> with our dedicated volunteers. Um, and each of those efforts in the past, and I think this is interesting, um, which were you know, ultimately you know, enacted by the public and supported by the Parks Department, brought about these major advances in how we manage our urban forest. Um, data from the 2005 effort was, effort was used to, um, in a for, US Forest Service model that estimated the annual environmental benefits that all of our street trees provided and actually directly led to Million Trees in New York City, which is this, uh, this huge um, campaign 
campaign to plant and care for a million trees that's been replicated across the country and I think actually also globally. Um, back in 1995, the census data was leveraged to justify to Mayor Giuliani that we really needed him to fund a programmatic block by block block by block tree pruning program. Um, and it also led to Park's kind of first um, implementation of a customer service of a service level agreement and um, we identified like in 95 that there was like 10,000 standing dead trees in the streets which was just this horrible thing um, but now you know because of that we pledge to remove all trees within 30 days of a request so you know so we know the Parks Department we've used this data really really well in the past um, now, looking forward to 2015, Parks has been working with a local nonprofit called Tree Kit, which has developed a really simple way for volunteers to very accurately map curbside trees. And I'm pleased, very pleased to say that we're now working with them to build it out into a platform that's going to support the mobilization and data collection effort next spring. Um, but it's in the planning and thinking about what Parks should be doing after the data that got collected that attracted me to the summit and ultimately led me to be standing up here in front of all of you tonight. Um, I had been starting to think a lot about how through the Street Tree Census effort, the Parks Department could engage with an audience that's kind of more than just our traditional tree stewards, the people who show up to our other planting events and come and, you know, like water their new street trees, um, and how we could engage a broader cross-section of the audience in, of, of the New Yorkers in managing our urban forests. And in particular, because I come from this data world, um, through the data itself and how it could be useful to all these great volunteers that we know are going to come out and help us collect it. Um, so we, um, we at Parks all along have been planning to, you know, after the 2015 Street Tree Census to load the data into our forestry management system, which is super cool and two-way integrated with 311. And we use it to manage all our work orders. And we will also plan to use it to maintain the street tree data going forward. Um, and this will most immediately help us improve our own planning and our operations. Um, we are also starting to sketch out how we might be able, to be able to deploy a better tool that would allow our tree stewards to track their tree care activities um, and coordinate their efforts with that of other tree stewards in their neighborhoods and of course to you know, kind of share what they're doing through social media channels. But I had the sense that you know, maybe we should really be thinking even a little bit more broadly than that. And so that was what led me to the Code for America Summit where I wanted to learn, I wanted to learn more about what would be possible. Um, and what was the most exciting thing for me to learn there was actually about how government and the civic tech community, so that's like all of you guys, um, could collaborate to develop these tools for the public to access and use this municipal data that's out in the open. I personally have a hard time navigating New York City open data, <laughs> identifying authoritative data from not authoritative data. Um, and so I can only imagine how, as a member of the general public, you can really struggle to utilize the great information that is available there. Um, and but and of course, while I knew about the Big Apps competition, I was part of helping make sure the 2005 Street Tree Census data was available for the first one. Um, I did start to um, wonder, hang on, now I lost my spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had no sense like before going to Code for America, the summit, how closely the brigades and the city governments have actually managed to deploy some really amazing digital tools. Um, so in terms of specific examples and projects that really stuck out with me, so you know, coming at it from the lens of, you know, how could we help, how could we have, make this data that the public's going to help us collect really widely available and accessible to them. Um, I was really inspired by the example of like the Large Lots program in, um, to address urban blight in Chicago, where the tech community collaborated with the city very directly to develop a website that would allow property owners to easily identify those city-owned lots. Um, I guess I'm running out of time from the abandoned buildings on their block. 
um, that they could buy for a dollar. I really, really liked Citigram a lot, which was a geo-based notifications platform for citizens that was developed, I think, by the Charlotte team, um, which made the 311 data super accessible and digestible, and also allowed people to sign up for notifications on specific topics within a certain geography. I already have like dead tree reports kind of like in the back of my head as a wish list. Um, the um, entire defaulting to open panel, though, was what was really eye-opening for me. Um, as someone who's worked in municipal GIS for more than 15 years, um, I always had a sense of why data standards were important, but I never quite connected that idea of data standards to how to this larger notion of getting local data into global apps until I heard it explained kind of like multiple times by Stephanie Hannon, Mike Matursky, and Mark Head at the summit. Like I had known from just my own travels that every time I go to a new city and I open Google Maps, there was just magically this transit information, <laughs> transit routing information that would appear. Um, but what I didn't know was that it was very, I didn't know the backstory. I didn't know if it was very specifically the um, I think the generalized transit feed specification that made it all possible. And so it all, you know, all the, this idea about open data standards also made me start to think more deeply about the potential of the new open trail standard, which is another Code for America project, and how we could use it at parks in conjunction with some of the other land managers in the city to, you know, create a better experience for public that are trying to manage our public air, our, um, our public spaces, but that's a bit of a digression. Um, it was really when, and I, so I echo what Matt was saying, it was really when Transit Mix was presented on the main stage that I was like, boom, like my mind was blown. I drank the rest of the Code for America Kool-Aid and, <laughs> and knew that somehow at parks we have to make um, a plan, we need a plan to not to just integrate the new street tree census data into our internal work management application, but make it available in a way that all New Yorkers would be able to use it to create the sort of tools that they want, not the tools that I think they might want on top of that. Um, and so, you know, with that, those are you know, my thoughts from the summit. I look forward to continuing to learn from everyone here about how we might be able to work together and write the next chapter in the story of the city's urban forest. Uh, I, I will have to say that we have, so Citigram, this notification system, if you go to citigram-nyc.heroku.com, uh, we have a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I'll post it on the meetup. Um, we have a sample instance that one of the co-organizers who couldn't be here tonight, uh, Chris, and a bunch of other people got working at the last hack night. Um, who else was working on that project? The last Vulcan was working on it. Um, what, what's the URL? Okay, I'll post it once I r get Vulcan to tell me exactly what it is. But it's this really amazing uh, notification system, and it's and it's something that uh, you know I can imagine if we could get more structured data from the city, we could be getting the push notifications that we get for tweets and Facebooks and all those other things, but about our municipal services. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand this off to uh, Will Scott, uh, the uh, our, our brother from Seattle who's in town for a few months at a fellowship. I'll let him explain his life story and uh, his his little insights um, cool. so thanks Noel yeah so I'm one of the brigade co-captains in Seattle and I guess part of what what was so exciting about the summit is also exciting here which is seeing how our much smaller brigade in Seattle gets to grow into something like this one day uh, which is super inspiring right and like New York is definitely on the forefront of this in a lot of ways uh, which is really cool um, one thing that I took away from the summit that I think has been alluded to um, but hasn't been mentioned explicitly um, that's worth saying is that Code for America as an organization said that they really have decided that in order to go from just sort of saying open data, open data, awesome, uh, government tech, we're going to do this. Um, they're focusing on three major focus areas in the next year and that's just sort of worth thinking about that they want their resources to focus on health economic development and safety and justice as like the three areas that they see tech being most effective in making impact um, in government. And I think that like, you look at all of that stuff that came on in the summit and all of these projects and it, I think it really uh, is pretty self-evident <laughs> that like those things are places where there's been a lot of successes and that that seems like they're 
really on the money. Um, what did I come away with? I think that Citigram example that Noel was talking about, uh, partially because Citigram, despite being made by the fellows in Charlotte and Lexington, for whatever reason, they chose Seattle as their like beta deployment. So I go to Citigram and I can already do this. Um, and, and you've got a New York one too. So New York gets 311 and vehicle requests. It's really easy. You say, I want to see the 311 things near me. Is it not going to work? No, 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 it does. It works. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the notifications. Oh. Yeah, there they are. Okay. They show up. So you can see. Oh, you might not be able. Yeah, there they are. So you get to see sort of all of the things that have happened in the last week. You see how many you would get a week if you subscribe to it. And you can subscribe by text or get a weekly email digest. And so I think, again, this is we're moving beyond just saying open data is so cool to, OK, there's all this data. There's too much data. It's not I just want I don't just want the government to give me more data. I need to figure out how to do something useful with it. How do I get the data that's relevant to me? Um, so I think this is part of this growing up of we're not just sort of saying I want I want to see this, but now what do I do with it? Um, another one that I think is also part of this sort of how do we do useful things and how do I focus on what's useful to me was Nextdoor, um, which is these very hyper local uh, neighborhood social networks. Um, they'll do postcards or things like that to actually make sure you live in a specific, you know, couple city block area. And then they're working on how do we then get that city block to engage with their local politicians. How do we actually do that connection to politics as sort of where they're moving, um, which is really cool to see. So I think, I think what I've taken away from this summit as opposed to last year is we've, we've gone past just being excited about open data to now we need to actually do something cool with it. Um, and it's really cool to see this progressing. Cool. And Will, how long are you going to be in town for? Awesome. So uh, come, come to a hack night and you'll find Will and we can cross collaborate uh, across the continent. Um, all right. So uh, next up is uh, Randy and Mike from MapZen. Um, they actually have a pretty awesome, not, they also run MapTime or at least they host MapTime. Um, so if you're into cartography, this is a, um, a great small event. It's capped at 30 people to learn about GIS, but I'm going to let them talk about their insights. They, uh, because they're kind of, um, uh, what is that term? Buttoning up together. Um, they're going to get 10 minutes. So. Um, wow, OK. Yeah. Great. Right. So yeah, um, actually, it's going to be more like five minutes, because you know Noel asked me initially to uh, come and speak about the, the Code for America Summit. And while I was there, I actually skipped like 90% of the sessions. And it's not because I'm an asshole, although. <laughs> Maybe it is, but uh, but actually it's because we sponsored it, and, and when we because we sponsored it, we did a lot of things like we hosted a lunch, we hosted a table, and so all I did there was logistics. Puzzles. So yeah, puzzles uh, was one. So I actually don't have slides, but if you take a look at our Twitter stream, so Twitter it's uh, Ma at Mapsen uh, at Twitter. Um, you can you know look back through the history, and you can see all we did these woodcut puzzles that were really interesting. Um, we sponsored a table. We did all this different stuff. So just to talk quickly about MapSyn and what we do and why that makes sense for Code for America and why we were interested, we're an open source mapping lab. We're located a few blocks up the street, six blocks, seven blocks, whatever. Um, and we work on open source, uh, open source and open data mapping tools and applications. So one of the things we're doing is a geocoder. Another is rendering, vector rendering, and OpenGL and WebGL. You can check this out if you go to our website, mapsyn.com. Another thing is turn-by-turn uh, -turn navigation. So we have an Android app coming out soon that does this turn-by-turn -turn navigation. And I want to bring this up because some, a few people have mentioned Transit Mix. We're actually providing the back-end routing service to Transit Mix for free. Um, and everything that we're building is a platform, and we want to do a lot with civic tech and offer a lot of these things for free. So if any, you know, we're not really quite production yet on a lot of these things, but it's production enough to host Transit Mix and have that work really well. So as you drag the routes, it's actually hitting our servers to, to um, you know, tell you where the bus can and cannot go. So we're doing that for, you know, routing, for geocoding, and also for vector rendering. So if anyone's interested, we'd love to chat um, afterwards. So, um, you know, 
when, so not only did we sponsor the, the summit, but we also made a major gift to Code for America, in particular to let them focus a little bit more on geo. You know, so we, we work on maps and we thought that was a great thing. Also, we have a history with Mike Magursky, who's the CTO at a few different companies. Um, I've worked with him and he worked with him at, um, you know, when he was at Stamen Design at, at, a, at a few different places. So it's great to see him there and having the impact he's having. Um, and one thing that we noticed was when the Pluto data set opened up in New York City, it, you know, instantly geocoder, open source geocoders worked really well as that data went into OpenStreetMap. And the 3D models of New York of New York City worked really well too. So we wanted to see if Code for America could be, you know, um, freed up to do some more to get some more of this data into the public domain. And so one of the things we're, we've been talking about with Mike and with others at Code for America is to um, do a an open parcel standard and get some get some open addresses into the into the um, the public domain. And I was at an event one night, I think it was drinks, and I think I'd had a few drinks, I'll be honest, but um, someone asked me, like, you know, they were asking me to explain what we were doing, and I was saying, oh, we're doing this, you know, standard with, with parcel data, and their eyes kind of glazed over, and they were like, oh, standard, you know, that's, that's so, you know, that's so boring, like, what, you know, what, what does that mean, isn't that, isn't that doomed to, like, you know, bureaucracy and failure, and I was like, well, you know, I'm like, Mike Mugurski is working on it, so I, I feel like it's gonna be okay, and I, and I was like, I left, and I'm like, oh, is that true? Like, is, it, is, is this, is this going to work out? But the next day, I wish I had a slide for this. Um, I can send it around, but I went to, one of the talks I went to, I, I made it to, was Mike's, and, and the, the title of the slide is How We Do Standards. And when I saw this slide, I was like, this is great. This, to this is totally great. So they do, um, like, the, the bullet points here are people, not data. So to identify and serve the needs of end users. And one of the interesting things is you can see there's a project called Open Addresses. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that, but um, a lot of the work that they may be doing may be within Open Addresses, so it's something that's actually happening uh, right now. Work with government, reflect human and tech infrastructure, don't pick winners, uh, support an ecosystem of data consumers. So this idea of like supporting what's, what's already working, like in the Open Address example, and then don't pick at it, so no revisions after a year, uh, at, no revision, no revisions for one year after 1.0. So this was a very good, very human uh, slide, which made me feel really good about the, the work that we can do together. So anyway, here's Mike, who's not an asshole, and he went to most of the sessions. So yeah, yeah he'll have something better to say. Yeah. Uh, just barely, though. Um, so I'm Mike. I'm introduced as not an asshole. Uh, I work with Randy at Mapsen, and sort of like Jacqueline, uh, I was fairly new to the civic tech space. Uh, I've been sort of in open source software for a long time, but not specifically on the sort of, uh, you know, the civic end of it. And so I always knew about Code for America, and but uh, what I knew about it was more the, uh, the fellows and their projects, uh, you know, sort of like Transit Mix, which we worked on a little bit at Mapsen, uh, and uh, the, the food stamp project I was pretty impressed with. And so I was sitting there, you know, in the sessions, sort of like a good citizen, and, uh, you know, just thinking, like, yeah, oh, I've got a handle on this. You know, like the, these people that go to this town, they, you know, work with the government, they make a thing, they come here with the town, everyone's amazingly well spoken, and they put on this amazing conference with Britney Spears headsets and stuff. And, uh, and so it wasn't until, also, Randy and I didn't coordinate on this, and we we're kind of shooting from the hip here, and I didn't know he was going to gush about McGursky, too. Uh, but I didn't really get it until, or get what Code for America was all about. Uh, until I watched uh, McGursky's talk, which is called Defaulting to Open. And uh, if you have four minutes to spare and you don't want to watch all the videos up there, I would say watch uh, sort of McGursky's kickoff to this thing, uh, which then goes into the panel. The panel's also great. But the first four minutes, he sort of talks about how, how he came to be the CTO of Code for America. And uh, what attracted him to that was uh, he heard a statement called uh, Government as a Platform. And what, uh, you know, what that meant to him was that you know, it's more than just sort of these little tools that are fixing symptoms of large problems. You know, like you know, you're making it easier to get food stamps. You're making it easier to you know, manage going to court. You know, those, are, those are symptoms of sort of much larger problems. Uh, but when uh, you're trying to make a platform, you're sort of in it for the long haul. You know, you're in it to sort of make everything accessible to the community. Uh, and it wasn't until I heard that, until I saw that talk, uh, that I really got, uh, you know, what Code for America was trying to set up. You know, not just 
making these sort of one-off bootstrap problems, uh, you know, sort of solutions to these symptoms, uh, but really trying to make a platform to make, uh, you know, make everything better in the long haul. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. Uh, next up, I should figure out how to make this. Uh, we're going to have Tamir uh, from Living Cities talk about his general insights. So thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Tamir Novotny. I'm with Living Cities. And I want to talk to you today about just the incredible evolution we've seen over the past few years um, of civic tech going increasingly towards social impact. Let me give you a little bit of context about me and about Living Cities so this all makes sense. We are a collaborative of 22 of the largest foundations and financial services companies in the world. If they're too big to fail, they're on our board. Um, and we exist to help harness the collective power and influence of those institutions to improve cities and the lives of their low-income residents. I sit on our public sector team, which focuses particularly on the role of local government in making that happen. Our members got us engaged in the civic tech space about three years ago, and we did a closed-door session with the CEO of Code for America, Jen Palka, Nigel Jacob, founder of Mirror Mechanics, a couple other leading lights in the field. They all basically told us the same thing, which is that the possibilities behind civic tech were incredible, but what we had yet to see relative to the possibility was impact particularly in the lives of the hardest to serve. And so over the last three years, we've been exploring this question of how can cities harness civic technology to improve the lives of their low-income residents? And Having been now at my third Code for America Summit, um, just incredibly blown away by the pivot that the field as a whole, as a national and even a global movement, I mean, there were brigades there from here to Pakistan. I mean, that alone blew me away. Um, a pivot that the field is making to get at really deep problems. I'm going to talk about a few things that particularly inspired me right now. One is taking on bigger issues. Um, so a few years ago, people, I think this is unfair, but people were kind of making fun of adopt a hydrant. like, oh, you're going to shovel a fire hydrant, whatever, right? Wrong. But um, a couple of people at the summit, including Jen Palka and the director of community organizing, Catherine Bracey, were really wrestling with this thing of, well, we have this sort of tectonic moment right now in Ferguson, Missouri. A lot of unrest, endemic of a lot of issues around the criminalization of poverty and race relations in America at a time when we'll be majority minority in 25 years. What's our role? Well, I don't know what we'd do if we went there, but what if we could predict it? This is warrants issued per 1,000 people in 2013. By the way, all these images are taken from SlideShare from CFA Summit Slides. That's Ferguson. So imagine if you had three to five data points that taken together could predict this kind of powder keg situation, and you could go to a city and say, guess what? You have a 75% possibility of being the next Ferguson in the next five years. You just turn the decriminalization of poverty into a business. Two, reaching more vulnerable populations. So a couple of people have talked about the Detroit Water Project. I want to share two things. One, half of Detroit's water and sewerage department residential customers were passed to. These are stories of people who have to bathe in grocery store bathrooms, who have to choose between medicine and food and water. This tool, crowdfunding donations to help people pay their water bills, raised 575 thousand dollars in just a couple of months since it launched. Finding people who can use it is of course a challenge as well, but even the creators of this acknowledge, as somebody said, there are some systemic issues at play here. Why is that the case? And what's the role of technology in taking on those deeper systemic problems? Really inspiring moment. Three, a few people have talked about within four. This is kind of a self-serving image. That's Frank Hebert from Open Plans on a project that Living Cities was a part of in Louisville. Um, doing some user testing with young people down there as part of a project kind of similar to Mind Mixer, using Twitter to engage folks around social media. Um, but also for there's Louisville's jail population management dashboard, not a whole lot of end user testing of people who are in the system, but people who manage the system. But the idea was just that as long as, you know, stuff is being designed for people, it's not going to get the results you want. That we've talked about, what we've talked about less is what that really means. And one of the key things when we're talking about social equity and economic equity in America is reaching communities of color and low income communities in particular. There are some important things that come with that around legacies of mistrust, legacies of bad policy, you know, that play a role in whether people let you in. 
And there's a lot about civic tech that's not just making the tools better, but actually making government better at reaching communities. That's something that we're really focused on as an organization. Um, and for deeper changing government, sort of vibing on that theme, this is actually a picture of a Code for America fellow doing user research in a social welfare office. I want to say this was in Denver. Um, that's the future face of government, right? And we work with cities. We work with about 40 cities across America, chiefs of staff, policy directors, innovation directors, who care about this stuff. They want to do better at reaching people. They want to provide better service. They want to treat people with the respect that they deserve. And it's really hard. And the idea that they can actually ask people what their experience is like and do something with the answer, I hate to say it, it's a sea change. Um, but it's one that they're really excited about and they're really grateful for the energy of people like <coughs> the NYC all around the country and making that happen. So what does this mean for the field? Three things, and again, my sort of vantage point on all this stuff is national, so forgive me if this is a little pie in the sky. One is that we're starting to see movement toward deeper collaboration between key local players. So you can see a Code for America brigade, a local data organization, community groups, local government officials collaborating more intentionally and moving toward a focus on specific results, really moving the needle on big problems that matter, sort of piece by piece. Two is new capacities in government. So imagine taking things like human-centered design, agile approaches, new approaches to risk management so you can actually have conversations about risk taking that don't always end in no. And that being a core part of how government does business. One of the, the presenters at the summit said, I want my kids to have no idea what it's like for government to suck. <laughs> Sorry, I'm almost done. Um, and third, just to bring this up again, because I think it's that important, an intentional focus on inclusion. Um, there was a really great conversation in a breakout about CFA brigades, diversity as one piece, but also sort of getting, getting engaged with communities in a different way and bringing community participation into the heart, not just of government, but into the heart of civic technology in that movement. Um, so, and I'd love to talk more about that too. What does it mean for Beta NYC? You know, I, I, one of the things I love about Beta NYC is the sort of talk is cheap culture. And so I want to be honest, I don't know how much bandwidth I have to think about this stuff and how to do it, but I would love to have a conversation about it and see what's possible. So that's me. Thanks for the extra few seconds. Great. Thanks. All right, let's see if I can figure out who we slotted to be next. Um, we totally, you know, just shook up the, the, and it's Ariel, yay! Uh, Ariel told me that she works for the mayor's office, but her thoughts are her own. Um, and you have slides, which is the one that everybody has been seeing for every time I get yeah, back I've to. Yeah, I've been up like yeah. 10 times already. I know. There you go. Uh, I think Tamir was the perfect person to go ahead of me. Um, I'm a newly minted uh, new face of government. Um, I last year was a fellow with Code for America working on the Kansas City team. Uh, my year at Code for America, I went to just figure out how this government thing works and how I could design better for the cities that I love. Um, I ended up being inspired to stay on the inside um, and sign up to be full time. Uh, so in September, uh, I started as a product director at HHS Connect, which is part of the New York City Mayor's Office of Operations. I'm lucky to have several of my teammates uh, joining me this evening too to be introduced to the world of Code for America. Uh, so at the summit this year, um, it's actually, for me, it was a big comparison from the summit the previous year where I was on the main stage as a speaker last year and very involved in the preparation and planning. And this year I came more as an attendee, but also with my public servant hat on. And what I heard were speakers talking about people. Um, this is Jennifer Palka opening up the summit. Um, this is a quote from Ezra Klein talking about healthcare.gov. Um, this quote was published actually about a week after the summit last year. Um, the news of uh, healthcare.gov and the failure of it had broken uh, just a few weeks before the summit and we were really feeling the effects of it in our friendly civic tech community there and what was gonna happen, we didn't know. And what I love about this quote is it talks about what really failed. The website failed, that's what the media talked about by and large, but was, what was actually failing at the same time was the policy. And the technology that we build is the intermediary between our end users, our residents, 
and our government and the policies that we create. This in particular quote um, really struck me through the heart um, in my new role um, where I'm working on health and human services issues um, and making sure that we are no longer a barrier um, to this bureaucracy and the poor that we serve who so desperately need our health and services. Um, said another way, um, I think this is dignity by default. This is Rebecca Coleus, who's the new health lead at Code for America. She's actually a doctor um, who has come into more of the technology and policy side. Um, my dream is dignity by default for all services, not just our health services. Um, and I hope we can really make that future happen. Um, there were a lot of people at the summit who were talking about how this can happen. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that in practice. Um, so several people talked about this. Um, this is Lauren Allen McCann gave a brilliant speech about build with, not for. Uh, not only uh, did she give a great talk at the summit, she also has a blog post. She publishes a lot on Medium. Um, so I've also provided URLs throughout um, of the pieces that I'm referencing. Um, I think her big takeaway quote is, there will be no trickle down civic tech. We can't just build it for people, we have to build it with them. And that really means engaging our users. Um, my part in the summit, in addition to attending, um, was hosting a panel that was called Makers to Mayors about building design and development capacity inside government, something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I was very fortunate to host one of the all-female panels at a government technology conference. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a big win and it was called out and it was one of only a few even in a community that's very inclusive. Um, so this group of women, uh, myself included, includes uh, Karen Jane, who's the deputy city attorney in Oakland, um, who in her furlough days took a design fellowship so she could start bringing a design process into her government and facilitates workshops where she does things like makes everyone draw the problem so she can make sure they're all really talking about the same thing. Uh, Krista Kanalakis, who's in the middle, who's an innovation officer with the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation. She's an entrepreneur herself um, and has great, created a great entrepreneurial practice of having outside entrepreneurs come in and work with city agencies and really understand their needs um, and build their products around some of those needs. Um, Ashley Hand, who's the Chief Innovation Officer in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with her last year. Her first day in City Hall was also my first day in City Hall in Kansas City. Um, she's done great things like has an open door policy. She On the floor she works on, she's literally the only open door. Um, so she makes it so that all staff can come and visit her. She's also done a lot of outreach into the field to talk to uh, not only the senior staff that she reports to, like the mayor and the city manager, um, but also the middle management and the staff who are really executing the things on the ground. Um, and then my friend Molly Ruskin, who's at the end, who is actually a New Yorker as well, but we've loaned her do to DC to join the United States Digital Service, um, which is brand new. Um, and she's helping facilitate the design process um, in government agencies. Um, they shared, you can watch our panel, it's about 45 minutes long. They shared a lot of details about this work and how they're doing it. Um, it's really impressive. And this is the new face of government. We're out there, we're really doing um, the work. Uh, there's also another big process, and um, I would I feel like I would be remiss to not talk about gov.uk um, in this. Um, we talked about this some on my panel as well, is that we're smaller shops that are trying to do big things, everything from the office of one, like Ashley in Kansas City, um, to someone like me who works in a slightly larger, better funded office. We have technology staff. Um, we are delivering very, very large projects. Um, but there's also this, um, which is the Cub.UK process. I call it change by revolution. Um, they were actually mandated from the top um, to change the way they were delivering all of their digital services and go digital by default. Um, so the top is what we normally see in government IT. Um, you do some policy creation, you capture the requirements, you procure it, you do some development, and then you launch it. And maybe at the end you think about user needs um, and you make sure that people can use it, um, but it's not an iterative process. 
gov.uk, the way they work, the users are along for the ride in every part of the journey. Um, so in the discovery phase, they're also about building iterative technology. Um, so they build an alpha, they build a beta um, user test along the way. They actually have an entire user testing lab. Um, services that pass that test get the crown. I just think all digital services should get the crown. I just, like, it's great, right? Um, and then it goes on to be live and it continues to be an iterative living product um, that is giving feedback from the users and they change things based on that continual feedback that they get. Um, Tom Lusmore, um, who's one of the co-founders of Gov.uk, shared this, and this is my dream too, um, that we have these dignified, respectful, easy to use services that we make it straightforward, that it's like, hey government, you can sort it out for me. Um, so this is my dream. Thank you. This is an, also an early prototype of Citigram, um, <laughs> just to point that out there. Uh, all right, who's next up? Coming up. Um, wait, did we get to the end? Yeah, I wanted to ask, was there anyone here tonight that didn't speak, that, w that went to the summit, that wants to say anything? Worth a shot. Oh, well, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give my, my insight. Yeah. You ready? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, short, brief insight. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Noel. Hi. Uh, you get all my emails. Um, I attended a lot of, uh, I attended um, a pre-session, I attended two pre-sessions. Uh, one was on Code for All, which is Code for America's uh, international program and then the brigade uh, Chris and I attended the the brigade pre-planning event of the summit and both of them kind of really talked about um, values uh, at least uh, at the code for all uh, conversation that was a, a real big focus of you know if we are engaging this at an international conversation what does that mean for all of us uh, particularly if we expand to uh, into governments that aren't open, nor transparent, nor um, give their people uh, due justice. Um, can we, should we kind of embrace them as equal partners? Um, and I think that um, uh, the, what kind of came out of the Code for All conversation is that there is a, a desire to actually spin it out of the Code for America and to have it as something that could stand up on its own and kind of come up with its own governance and come up with an international governance that kind of describes the goals and the aspirations and, and to kind of put Code for America as one program that is uh, one of many, you know, Code for America isn't the one that's leading, but that we're all leading and that we all have issues that are very specific and, you know, all governments are trying to provide services, hopefully, that are trying to build people up, not beat them down. Um, and how do we kind of like uh, address that and how do we share and exist within that, that space? So that was the pre-summit, which, um, which was really awesome. They had really great food um, and a, a lot of great accents and a, kind of a very enlightening uh, series of conversations. The second one was um, kind of like the Meta Brigade Summit, um, which did a, um, uh, a kind of a, a diagram on, on power mapping. And so this is definitely something that we uh, we did. Well, that was one half of the workshop was focused on power mapping. That's definitely something that we really don't do within our own advocacy work within Beta NYC, uh, is that we don't sit down and, and draw an um, X and Y axis of like, who are the people that we need to be targeting to get the legislation passed? We just go, 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 go. Um, and if you say no, we're trying to go around you. Um, Cause that's what you do when you have very limited resources. Um, but that was a very enlightening uh, opportunity to, to, to sit there um, and to be thinking, okay, wow, all right. I've gone through this beforehand when we were talking about political organizing, um, which is not dissimilar, which is how I kind of got into this whole community organizing of the Beta NYC program to begin with. And in that community, we have a standardized practice. Um, you know, for those of you who worked on the Obama campaigns, both of them, um, you know, you were studying, and if you went through their different workshops, if you went to the New Organizing Institute, you, you, you were essentially uh, reading material that was pioneered through Marshall Gantz um, and um, Cesar Chavez. Like, this was coming out of the, the labor movement and, and actually, you know, 
focusing on the migrant worker movement and, and it all of this is talking about personal stories and but there's a developed practice of those personal stories so when we talk about building technology that actually impacts people we're putting people at the forefront and but there is a defined practice of how you go along with that there's a methodology and what struck me at the end of this whole conversation for you know my head, which was thinking about how do I provide um, a better leadership and a better structure of Beta NYC to the community, which you are all like I, I love seeing every single one of your faces every time you know um, we put one of these things together. But like, how do I do a better job about this? And so like my biggest takeaway is that how do I um, and how do I help? lead a community that has a defined structure that's replicable in the same way that I see within the political movements and that I see within the open source movements and that eventually I can just walk away from and that you can all like be the community leaders and you can be empowered to make the type of change that it takes a million people to do right like this is a city of eight to ten million people right we, it, if, if the the true change that we want to see we have to be embedded into everything and and, and for that to happen, we need to have a common language, common values, and a common practice that we're taking back and sharing with our brothers and sisters and neighbors. And so um, that was kind of like my takeaway. And I'm like, well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> How do I eat? Uh, I'm like, okay, well, I, I got this big belly. I can just live off of that. Um, and that, that just kind of, uh, it goes me to the next step of like, um, for this community to be sustainable, like we... Uh, I thank the people who have been standing up to, to do the leadership over the month that I was gone and that I got to spend um, some precious time with, with my family, and I thank you. Um, and and um, thank those of you who have stepped up to volunteer that I have yet to get back to, to, to give you the extra leadership um, and give you the extra opportunity to, to step up and be leaders. But we need this, this community is only the tip of the spear, and we need more leaders and, and kind of like, uh, while I need to be thinking about like how how to provide the leadership to make you make impact, um, we need more people to be stepping up and saying that they want to lead projects, um, that they want to lead ideas, that they want to run events, that they want to champion uh, even even just a conversation on the meetup list makes an impact. It shows that this is an active community, uh, and so um, so thank you. That's the most important thing because this community wouldn't have existed without you. Um, and then the second thing is we need more people um, to help lead. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering at some of these events, we'd love to have you and um, look forward for 2015 being a year of diversity of a number of people standing up in front of Beta NYC and leading the community. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Bill, for your leadership in this community in your leadership for organizing tonight. Uh, <laughs> you can't see. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for doing an amazing job condensing what was like several days of a lot of talking and thought and launches into what I thought was a pretty jam-packed session tonight. Um, so hopefully you guys got something out of it. You are welcome to stay and hang out. We have more beer and wine and snacks um, until what, 9.45, 9.30? Until, until you're demanded at home. Um, and like I said, we're Microsoft New York, and we are looking forward to hosting more events like this and meeting you where you are, wherever you are in New York. Um, and some of you might be coming Friday night. We're going to be having Susan Crawford and Stephen Goldsmith talking about The Responsive City, which is their new book. Um, it's a little sold out right now, but I'd be happy to sneak you on the list if you want to talk. Um, so thank you, and let's talk.